Quick heads up, the video you're about to watch contains insane spoilers for the anime Erased. If you haven't yet, go watch it, then come back and watch this. Trust me, it's worth it. Also, beware, there will be some graphic content and depictions of abuse and murder, so if that's not your thing, maybe sit this one out. Alright guys, enjoy the video. So, a little while ago, I found myself in an interesting situation. I had just finished watching Goblin Slayer for the first time and felt a little unsatisfied. The show itself is good, don't get me wrong, and if you can deal with all... ...this, then it's a fairly good action show to just binge. I felt, however, that the show didn't really have a whole lot of substance story-wise. So, while browsing Crunchyroll, I scrolled past a show that had caught my interest a while back and I decided to add to my watch list. That show was, of course, Erased. I really didn't know what to expect going into the show. I couldn't remember what the description on Crunchyroll said when I saved it in the first place and didn't bother reading when I went in for the second time. I was going in completely blind. And, within the first two minutes, I was beyond captivated. The show wastes no time showing us the ability our protagonist, Satoru, possesses. The ability to go back in time to prevent bad things from happening, or as he calls it, revival. Within only 10 minutes, we've met multiple of the story's major players, including Airi, Yuki, and Satoru's mother, also known as the best anime mom of all time. 11 minutes in, and we get to see Revival once again, this time to prevent a kidnapping, with a little help from his mom. At the 15 minute mark, we learn more about one of the victims we'll come to know very well, Kayo, and the guilt Satoru feels in having not been able to help her. Only two minutes later, Satoru's mom is killed by the kidnapper, and within the next five minutes, we see Satoru come home, get framed, use Revival, and be brought back to 1988. All within the first episode. Explaining it that way might make it sound like an overflow of information, but believe me when I say the pacing is simply perfect. And that isn't exclusive to the first episode. Each of the 12 episodes in this show are masterfully paced. I could go into painstaking detail over each episode's flow, but I would like to get some sleep tonight, so maybe another time. The first episode, however, gets you hook, line, and sinker. Its ending, like many of this show's cliffhanger endings, leaves you hungry for more. Eight of the 12 episodes end with cliffhangers, and because of that, this show was ridiculously easy to binge. That said, for your show to have cliffhangers that feel earned, the characters, and thereby the writing, needs to get you invested in the story. And boy oh boy does Erased deliver on that front. On paper, Erased doesn't sound like the most complex story. Go back in time, find killer, stop killer, victory. But, surprise surprise, there's a wee bit more to it than that. Satoru isn't trying to stop one murder, he's trying to stop four. On top of that, he has to deal with the fact that despite being 29 years old in 2006, in 1988 he's only 11, which seriously hinders his ability to get things done, while simultaneously putting him in further danger. He has to find a way to save Kayo from her abusive mother, and with no clues or evidence, dig up the would-be killer. And his first go-around, he fails miserably. In the end, all he's able to do is add two extra days to Kayo's life. He isn't able to save anybody and he's told multiple times by people close to him that he needs to be more trusting and allow others to help, and it's not until doing that do things work out for him. In his first attempt, many days after failing, he's thrust back into 2006. It would seem nothing has changed, that all of it was in vain. But, he later finds out with a little help from Irie that the date that Kayo had been killed changed from March 1st to March 3rd. He realizes that should he get the chance to go back, he can still save her. Which also leads to one of my favorite moments in the entire show. Chills, man. Every time. This time around, however, Satoru decides that he can't do this all on his own. So, when his friend Kenya offers to help him, Satoru divulges the information he's been keeping about Kayo. The two of them together come up with a plan to take Kayo away from her mother's abuse, and thereby preventing her from being killed. Eventually, all his friends get involved in helping out in one way or another, and in doing so, foil the plans of our would-be killer. Before I talk about the ending, however, there are a few characters I would like to break down as they are key components in what makes this show what it is, 
starting with our hero, Satoru. When we start our story, we see that Satoru is a fairly isolated individual, which is admittedly not a very uncommon trope in anime. He also seems to be a creative person, but just has trouble digging deep down into himself. We see him struggle for a job he doesn't seem to care for, while making no effort to befriend a girl that clearly has an interest in him. We then get to see his first on-screen revival, where he manages to save a little boy from being hit by a truck driver, and in doing so, hurting himself. Which is a theme that will come back later on in the show. In the hospital, even further proof of his isolation from others is clear when he states that there isn't anybody he wants to tell regarding the incident, not even his mother. This disconnect is still present when he goes back to 1988, and it's because of this attitude that he fails. His inability, or perhaps unwillingness, to rely on others is what costs him. Part of this is again explained in the final scene of the show, so I'll touch on that in a bit. Outside of that one character flaw, Satoru is a very bright individual. We get to see how clever he can be when he sets up the police to be Yuki's alibi. His plan to hide Kayo to give time for the child's services to act and his plan to catch the killer at the end of the show. Another brilliant thing about this show is how we get to see the way that Satoru, a 29-year-old, picks up and understands things that his friends simply wouldn't be able to. The two best examples of this of course being him finding the kidnapper's supplies and the candy inside Mr. Yashiro's car. <laughs> His intellect combined with his human flaws and drive to save everyone he can are what make him so entertaining to watch. He's smug, but not cocky. He's smart, but not all-knowing. He's an adult, but still childish. He's simply a very engaging and entertaining protagonist, and if we couldn't believe him as a character, then we wouldn't be able to believe anyone else as one either. Kayo is another especially important piece of the puzzle, and is probably the character most would have the strongest emotional connection with. Her story is incredibly sad. As a very little girl, her father would beat her mother until she finally left, taking Kayo with her. Unfortunately, much like real life, that anger and sadness is often passed down, and in this instance, from Kayo's mother to her. Within the first few minutes of meeting her, we know something is very wrong, and by episode 3, we see the extent of the abuse she receives, and it's quite possibly one of the saddest scenes I've seen in an anime to date. <laughs> Her words, combined with the look on Satoru's face, is just gut-wrenching. Her scream to not be touched, and the fear she feels when her mother emerges. There's barely a break after this, as the next scene is Kayo being nearly drowned by her mother. Needless to say, we immediately as an audience want to help and protect Kayo, and therefore want Satoru to do the same. Her role in the story is larger than just being a damsel in distress, however. A lot of especially important character growth for Satoru would not be possible without Kayo. See, despite the different circumstances at home, both are very independent and isolated in a way. <laughs> The most important message that they teach one another is that they don't have to be alone. They have friends surrounding them. They just need to make the effort to accept and understand that. If not for Kayo, Satoru couldn't have won in the end. And somewhat paradoxically, Kayo couldn't have helped him learn that if he didn't save her. It's through his friends that he was able to save Kayo, and learn from that to save others as well. Kayo is the linchpin to the story's entire message. 
しかし彼は死ぬことはなかった僕はそいつにスパイスと名付けて観察することにしたそれが君だよサトル Now let's take a look at our antagonist, the kidnapper, the murderer, the one pulling all the strings, Mr. Yashiro. Let's be honest. From the first couple episodes, I'm sure most of us guessed that he was the killer, while at the exact same time, we really didn't want him to be. For the majority of the show, he seems like a straightforward, nice dude, looking to help in whatever way he can. But the entire time, we get some subtle hints that make it look like there's more than meets the eye. Whether it's just odd character decisions or very blatant camera angles. And by the time we reach the last quarter of the show, those hints become a lot larger leading up to the chilling reveal. I don't mind that it was foreshadowed pretty heavily, as Yashiro is such a nice character that you really don't want to see it come into fruition. You desperately want to be wrong, you want it to be someone else, but that simply isn't the case. Hell, Satoru himself states that he saw the father he never had as Yashiro. In that moment, he filled that hole in his heart, and I was right there with him. A small part of me was wondering if he would end up getting together with Satoru's mother. Needless to say, that is not what happened. Frankly, I think the way it was handled was incredible. His origin story of killing the hamsters, becoming fascinated by what he saw, and wanting to keep that drive alive is believable, as that is a common start for serial killers in the real world. The idea of the spider's threat is also very artistic and a creative way to convey his own twisted inner thoughts. The relationship between Yashiro and Satoru is also very captivating. Yashiro almost has some sort of demented love for Satoru. And it's not so much that it's Satoru specifically, it's what he represents to him. He's a connection to his old self. He's a risk. He's a challenge. He loves that part of himself and therefore feels a kind of love for Satoru. It's an incredibly unique relationship, and that's why seeing Satoru finally defeat him is so satisfying. Seeing that spider's thread above his head snap and Yashiro simply laugh at it is just so damn beautiful. But, if I'm gonna be talking about all these scenes and how amazing they are, I of course cannot leave out the masterpiece that is this show's soundtrack. No matter what the scene is, there's always a music track to fit it and enhance it perfectly. Whether the scene is sad, frightening, triumphant, or ominous. I'm not musically trained, so trying to break down each piece of music isn't my place. So, I'll play a few snippets of my favorite uses of the music in the show instead. これは歴史を変えたんだ。実相からわずかと思う。その母親が捨てたゴミ袋の中には網かけの手袋が入っていた。
<laughs> Something I am at least slightly qualified to talk about, however, is sound design. And let me tell you, the sound effects and music cues in this show are next level. My favorite example is whenever Satoru has Revival Activate. The sound that plays is aggressive, mysterious, and frightening all at once. What makes it even more impactful is how every time it plays, the entire scene took on a monochromatic look. Aside from that, every movement and important motion sounds real and just makes the entire experience that much more enjoyable from beginning to end. Speaking of the end, let's finally talk about it. There are a good amount of people who have seen the show and don't like its ending, and I've even seen people call it outright bad. And while I try to respect everyone's opinion, I just don't really understand that. The biggest complaint normally levied is that Kayo doesn't wait for Satoru and that she should have married him. To which I say, why? Yeah, they were cute as children and a crush between the two is apparent, but why does that mean they need to be married? Is the argument because Satoru saved Kayo? Again, why should that matter? Just because 15 years ago Satoru helped Kayo, that means she has to marry him? That's a pretty selfish way of thinking. And, if you paid attention, it's pretty obvious what the show's core theme is. It isn't a love story between Satoru and Kayo. It's a story about friendship. Think about it. The story begins with Satoru getting into a car accident, going to the hospital, and not even having anyone he thinks would be concerned enough to bother telling. Meanwhile, at the show's end, even after being in a coma for 15 years, he has a large group of friends. Not just friends, but buddies. Good buddies he could rely on, and in the end, save him, after he saved them. More than anything, this is simply a story of friendship. It's through Kenya, Hiromi, Kayo, and the others that he's able to trick and defeat Yashiro. It's all done through his friends. We are never truly alone. If we look hard enough, we will always find our friends. I think that's the primary message of Erased, and if you disagree, that's perfectly fine. That's just my take on the show. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Just from writing the script, I can tell this is going to be a long one, so thanks for making it to the end. I'm going to be taking a bit of a break next week, but when we're back, we'll keep up the trend of spooky halloween -y content by taking a look at Death Note. Hope you guys are looking forward to it. See you next time, everyone. Peace.